What's up, everybody? Andrew Cooper here, Alarm Fantasy Football. As you can see, Howard Bender not here today. Baseball starts tomorrow. Boo. Uh, but the good news is I get to bring my friends on. I have Pat Fitz on to talk instead. So, Pat, how are we doing, brother? How's it going? Coop, doing great. Uh, am, am I still welcome if I say I like baseball? Or I like baseball, too. I, that's, that's the thing is that on the Alarm Fantasy Football show, I have to throw a boo, a quick boo out there. But I do like baseball. I play uh, I play fantasy baseball, too. Who's your favorite baseball dude? Uh, I'm a Brewers guy. I grew up in Milwaukee. Oh, so, okay. uh, you know, I, I have to bear that cross, unfortunately. Right. I heard that stadium's great. Like everybody that that goes out there says they like it. It is, man. It's a it's a really nice park. The only thing is, like, I grew up with County Stadium as their home park, and that was like a true outdoor stadium. It's like the difference between riding in a car with a sunroof versus being in a convertible. Okay. So, like, in a, a really nice summer day, eh, it doesn't really feel like you're outside. But uh, small complaint, you know, when you go to these early games in April and it's 40 degrees outside, you're pretty happy to be inside with the roof closed. Yeah, it's so funny seeing uh, all the because even when even when it's still nicer, you still see all the guys that come like the Dominican guys with like, you know, the face masks and everything for those games. Right. Uh, I mean, I, I grew up going to Fenway Park and, you know, it's like that probably the most uncomfortable, but you can't complain about it because it's so iconic. You know, uh, we used to buy obstructed view tickets, me and my uncle, and we just walk around and watch the game. You know, because there's you'd be surprised. There's so many seats in there that aren't even facing the right direction or they're behind a pole. It's just a ridiculous thing. Yeah. yeah, that place is uh, it's it's magical. I'm I'm glad I got to go there. My wife ran the marathon there like God, it's almost like 20 years ago now. So uh, I, I bought a ticket uh, from a scalper for the Patriots Day game. They were playing the Yankees. I mean, what a great day to make that your one Fenway Park visiting experience. I got to get back there. The place is just so amazing. That's the day to do it, man. That Monday, dude. Marathon Monday. Awesome, bro. All right. Well, let's get to some football. But let's get the SEO on track here, right? Pat? Like now that we're, now we're <laughs> the, the algorithm is saying this is a baseball show. Don't worry, folks. This is a football show. What we're going to do today is what we've been doing with our guests. We're going to look real quick at news and, and rumors. I'm going to ask Pat some questions about his strategy, things that I think we can steal from him and uh, to help us out. You know, we've had uh, – fellow fantasy pros guys like Derek Brown on we've had you know like Jack Falcone Dave Kluge we're trying to we're trying to pick your brain steal some of that and then in the last segment which is going to be the bulk of the show I've got a fun little thing planned for you guys what I'm going to do because I've been doing all the free agency stuff I'm going to go through and look at all the teams where I think they could use a specific type of player profile type and I'm going to describe that type of player and see if Pat, who's I know you guys have been digging through the prospects. I've been listening to your the new dynasty show you got going on over there. And we're going to have you kind of pick some guys that might fit that. So I don't know. What do you think? That sounds great, man. And uh, maybe we'll even make it to the fourth segment. Coop, we can do it. There, this time. there is a secret. That's the thing. Uh, <laughs> most people don't see the show sheet behind the scene. There is a secret fourth segment that I always put in there in case we need it. But in most cases, especially with you and me, we do, we do a little too much talking. There's not with, sure. you know, with, with Jax Falcone, we almost didn't make it to the third segment, which is usually the important one. So <laughs> let's blow through the news and notes here. Uh, real quick things that we don't need to really talk about from a fantasy standpoint, but this is a weekly show. So we like to get people updated, especially people listening at home. If you are listening, hit that like button, uh, give us a good review, uh, subscribe, download episodes, do what you can to support the show. But uh, real quick housekeeping with Jerry Sneed traded to the Titans after being franchise tagged by the chiefs cameron sutton has been released he's got some uh he's got some domestic issues going on there that we don't really want to get into and then damian harris is retiring obviously had a great you know little stretch with the patriots there helped them win a super bowl but uh you know lingering knee issues been the problem there uh, not too much fantasy relevant there though right that's yeah um We'll always have that 15 touchdown season from 2021. So uh, right. fond memories for anyone who had Damian Harris that year, I guess. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the other big news this week, the rule changes, right? So there's a bunch of stuff that isn't going to matter as much to us. The emergency QB rule, you know, you can now have a guy on a practice squad. They changed the trade deadline in the NFL, but it's like one week later. Uh, unlimited players coming back from the IR, but key players were already kind of coming back if they were healthy. Uh, big ones though, uh, there's going to be new reviews, play clock and QB out of bounds can be reviewed. Shouldn't really affect us with fantasy. The kickoffs. I got to ask you about the kickoffs back. Cause this is crazy. I actually had uh, 
no joke. I had never seen it. I'd never seen that one because I didn't watch too much XFL, but it is wild, huh? Yeah, same. I just saw that. So basically these guys, um, they're positioned at what is it like the 35 yard yeah. line, 40 yard line on the other side of the field. And they cannot move until the um, kick returner has the ball in his hand. So interesting. It's good to see the kickoff return back. That's always an exciting play. And, uh, you know, nice to have that. And the Steelers waste no time, go out and get Cordero Patterson to be their kick return guy. So, uh, yeah, I think it's going to add a little bit of excitement to the game. Yeah, and you know Belichick always plugged in with his um, with the rule changes and stuff. He takes it very seriously. Him and Rich McKay. Uh, that people say that part of the reason he didn't go to the Falcons is that he hates Rich McKay because they always disagree on the rule changes, right? Uh, but Belichick, before this even came down the pipe, went out and got Antonio Gibson and gave him a pretty big contract. Not only is he kind of that that kind of shifty scat back, but he also returned kicks before. So kind of interesting. That, uh, that he would go out and do that. But the, it looks cool. And also, I like the idea that there's going to be way less uh, touchbacks with this new thing, right? Yes. Yeah, I mean, the touch touchback rate was up to, what, like 80% or something like that. This should uh, – th those just aren't real exciting plays. So no, I to no, no. get rid of some of those. Yeah. And then the last one that, that really matters uh, is the hip drop tackle. Just want to get your take on that because, you know, everybody's got to take, I just want to get, get your feeling, whether you're on board, not on board. Do you think it, it's going to help any particular positions? Do you think that it's, uh, it's really going to mess up games? What are your thoughts with that? I don't think it's going to mess things up too much. Um, it's just, you know, we, we needed to get rid of that it was a dangerous play so glad that we're doing that and making the game a little safer i know some people think it's uh you know the ongoing sissification of the nfl or whatever but um you know i'm i'm glad like there were some serious injuries we saw mark andrews get hurt tony pollard some other guys miss substantial time to uh injuries as a result of the hip drop so good good move to get it out of the game yeah, I saw that. They, they, the study they did basically said that there was at least one per game and they resulted in 15 injuries, which is almost an injury a week. So for me, get it out. And I went back and pulled some. Uh, I went back and looked at when the horse collar came out. Same quotes. Fa Troy Palomalo coming out saying that, oh, everything's favoring the offense. Same thing. And guess what? Now everybody looks at the horse collar when it does happen and they say, wow that's dangerous. Like, you know, so I think that's, what's going to end up happening is that people are going to realize how dangerous this is. And it's going to fall in the same category as a face mask and a horse collar where down the road, when we do see one, we're going to say, whoa, like, you know, especially like you look at Mark Andrews getting hurt last year, man, that was an ugly play. Right. Yeah. That, and, and uh, kind of, kind of sad. Uh, quick shout out to the chat. What's happening. Simon, Jeremy and Dunn, Audi Coop. Thanks. Hey, thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, you know, we appreciate the support. As far as news, that's most of the news. Let's hit some real quick rumors, if that's all right with you. I I often like the rumors more than I like the the news. What do you think? It's just a, yeah, a little, absolutely. little more little more room for speculation. Oh, you know? of course. Yeah. Uh, you know, first thing people are talking about Kayla Williams with the pink phone, all that. I don't know if we really even need to get into. Uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter for, for on field play, does it? No, it doesn't. And, uh, you know, the hardcore, I, I'm a Green Bay Packers fan living behind enemy lines in the Chicago area. So, uh, you know, if the Bears fans are going to lose their minds over having a quarterback with a pink phone, I'm here for it, man. I, I'll, uh, that's free entertainment for me. So I'll take it. But uh, I, I don't think anyone should be worried about uh, the chances of Caleb Williams enjoying NFL success because he has a, a Hello Kitty phone. Yeah. I Honestly, though, as a Patriots fan, I'm like, yeah, pink phone, paint your nails, drive a pink car, whatever you got to do to move down to three. I'm on board with it. Like, next, I want to see him driving a pink VW bug with like the eyelashes on it next. Like, let's get him, let's get him down to three. Right. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. So, uh, speaking of the Patriots, Bob Kraft came out and said uh, that they were willing to pay for Calvin Ridley. They were willing to pay uh, not only the same amount as the tex as, as the Titans, but they were willing to cover the difference in taxes. The taxes are lower there. So they wanted to make that off the table. They were going to pay an extra 10% on top to cover that. But apparently, according to Bob Kraft, Ridley's, he said girlfriend, but it's actually his wife. His wife did not want to leave the South. And also the QB situation might have been a problem. So what were your thoughts on those comments and Bob Kraft being very, I mean, very forthright with, with a lot of information there? 
Yeah, I'm not sure uh, it, Calvin Ridley appreciated his game getting blown up like that by uh, Kraft. So that that was kind of interesting. Like, I don't really have a reaction to that, but it was interesting that Bob Kraft was so specific in the details with that. And uh, right. like, I'm not sure that's your best move for attracting free agents down the road. Seriously, though, to just air out, this is why it didn't work. Kind of shady. But, you know, it's clear what he was trying to do is basically say, hey, by the way, you know, we offer a lot of money. So fans can't be upset. And it's not that he didn't want to play here. It's that, you know, his girlfriend didn't want to come here or whatever. He's just covering his 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 behind here. So uh, is what it is. Uh, Cowboys, basically, uh, in talking about Dak Prescott hitting free agency, have said that uh, they are, the, the contract extension talks have stalled. And Jerry Jones even said, hey, we're all in on this year, and then we'll figure it out next year. What do you What do you take away from that? Boy, on one hand, I can understand not wanting to make that commitment after um, such a disappointing playoff performance and that early exit for the Cowboys. On the other hand, it feels like it's kind of lose-lose for the Cowboys. Either Dak has a great year and uh, takes them deep into the playoffs, and uh, you know, then Jerry's got to roll up the Brinks truck to Dak's house and uh, unload it for him, or um, like the alternative is Dak has a bad season. So it, it just it seems like kind of a rock hard place dilemma for the Cowboys. Yeah, for real. That, and that's the thing is that he just had like a top three fantasy season. But then in the playoffs, I mean, and he, his stats were good at the end of the game, 400 yards, three touchdowns. But anyone that watched that game, he put them in a hole. You know what I mean? Like yes. with the turnovers and everything. So I can see it both ways here, but I don't know. You got to be very careful because we just watched Kirk Cousins pick up his bags and take off. So, yeah. You got to be careful there uh, with the commanders. A lot of rumors swirling. We're seeing people in the know saying both that they like Jay Daniels best, that they like JJ McCarthy best. They've for a long time have been tied to Drake may. I want to ask you personally, and cause we're going to get to so many guys later. This is where I want to just ask you if you're the commanders, who are you taking? Who do you like uh, who after Caleb Williams, assuming he goes, who do you like Drake may? is my guy. Um, I like, I just think he's the, I don't know. You could see it in his game. It just seemed like he would translate to the NFL really well. And I think uh, I know Daniels is a dynamic rushing threat, but I almost think Drake Mays, um, the aggression he has as a runner is really kind of being undersold. Like he is a dual threat quarterback himself. And as good as the numbers were for Daniels last year, and they were truly amazing in that offense. I mean, he he did have a lot more to work with uh, as far as pass catching talent than Drake May had. And uh, just sort of a, a more wide open offense. The LSU defense was terrible, which kind of spiked some of the Jaden Daniels numbers. I just feel a little bit more confident about the translation for Drake May. The body type, I am a little worried about Jaden Dan Daniels getting like cut in half the way that guy take some kill shots. So, um, yeah, I mean, but there's so much steam on McCarthy coop. It's really interesting. Like a, a while ago on the urging of our own Thor Nystrom, our NFL draft and, um, college football analyst at fantasy pros. I put bets down on JJ McCarthy going number two. And I think I got him at like 22 to one and number three at nine to one. And I'm feeling pretty good about those bets now. Like, now, yeah, uh, well, now it's like, you know, now you can't even get close to the 22 to one. It's like, you know, like seven to one or something like that. It, it's I late. think it was, yeah. I think it had crashed a four to one for McCarthy going with the number two pick. Oof. I mean, now you got to, <laughs> now you might, you might as well hedge now and take him going forward too. I mean, if you got 22 to Probably one, should, you know, yes. might as well, yes. uh, but you know, hedging is for gardeners, not gamblers. <laughs> We'll see on that. Uh, J Jim Harbaugh, a guy that believes J.J. McCarthy is the best QB in this class. Of course, he coached him in college. He believes that four quarterbacks do go one, two, three, four. What do you think about that? Interesting. So either the Cardinals move down or, um, you know, I've even heard it floated that maybe the Cardinals trade Kyler Murray to Minnesota and keep that pick for themselves. Uh, that might be a little far-fetched. But, but um, I'll like, I could see it happening. I could see action on that. Th this draft is deep enough at wide receiver that the Cardinals do not necessarily have to be zeroed in on Marvin Harrison Jr. if they don't want to be. So yeah. um, it, it seems like there could be action with that number four pick. I mean, I think that's kind of where 
I don't want to say where this draft really starts because there might still be some intrigue on draft night as to how the quarterbacks are ordered at the top of the board. But um, yeah, it's going to be pretty interesting to see whether the cards keep that pick or uh, deal it. Yeah, there's an easy out for them, right? If if the Giants want a quarterback at four, they just jump down to six. Oh, you know, yeah. maybe, maybe now you maybe now you end up with Malik Neighbors instead of Marvin Harrison Jr. But think of all the extras you get with that. So. I mean, entirely possible. Last piece of uh, rumors I did want to mention. I saw somebody reported Jim Harbaugh has been living in an RV since moving from Michigan to L.A. That sound about right to you? It does. Uh, I'm not the biggest Jim Harbaugh fan in the world. So oh, there's come probably on. Probably some he's, sort of joke to be made here. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I want to touch that. Yeah, he is one of those guys, though, where, like, when it's good, it's good. But when it's bad... Then you look at all like the weird sayings and stuff, and you're like, all right, that's kind of weird. This guy's kind of weird, huh? Like with Dan Campbell, I feel that way too, where it's like he is a big rah rah guy, and when it's good, it's great. But when it's not good, you look back and feel like maybe not not, not a lot of substance to that, you know? So yeah, I can feel you on that. But personally, I just I love the quotes. Anybody that can give me a quote, as you know, us in the media, I love Jim Harbaugh. Just listen to him throw out ridiculous quotes. So. Uh, I got a rep for it. Uh, before we move on to the next segment, we did a quick quick question in the chat. McGonagall wants to know, uh, how do you like Curtis Samuel and Khalil Shakir next season with the Bills? So Curtis Samuel obviously signing with the Bills. They still have Stephon Diggs, still have Dalton Kincaid. Uh, we're predicting Diggs to be number one, but if you were going to pick somebody to be the second target on that team, what do you think? Yeah, um, I would probably think it's going to be Kincaid. Yes. And I know you're happy about um, the departure of Gabe Davis and what that could potentially mean. And um, man, like just the fact that we really saw kind of a nosedive from Steph Diggs in the back half of the season. Like I think from week 10 on, he averaged like 42.2 yards per game and something like 5.6 yards per target. It was pretty ugly. So there's opportunity galore for Kincaid. Um, I'm a big Shakir guy. I was pretty bummed by the Curtis Samuel signing, to be honest. I thought Shakir could maybe be the full-time slot guy. But then again, I mean, I think both of these guys have some degree of inside-outside versatility. Uh, I'd prefer to see Shakir in the slot, but I think he can play outside um, if they want him to. But yeah, that that was a little bit of a bummer for me. I mean, I know they needed to add a pass catcher. I just didn't want it to be a Curtis Samuel type. Not the right fit. Not the right fit. I loved it. My, I, when they added Mac Collins, I was like, "Wow, are we just gonna Mac Collins is a field stretcher doing nothing, and then Diggs and Kincaid, right. and that would have been right. great for fantasy, right?" So yeah, I was with you. I did not feel like the right fit at all. So I don't know. Uh, but anyway, that's it for the news and rumors. Let's get through quickly this second segment here. Uh, just want to ask you a couple things. Uh, one thing I've been asking every guest that comes on: What's your calendar is like? Your football calendar for me. Uh, it's a lot different than say Thor nice or Derek Brown. Like they go right into the rookie stuff. I do free agency stuff. Some people, I, you know, I mentioned Dave Kluge. He came on, he's like, I go hiking and stuff. He's like, I take a little break. So for you, once the season ends, what direction do you go in? Like what, what's your main focus kind of leading up to the draft? Oh man. Right after the season ends, Coop, there's some baseball involved for me, but, um, other than that, no, it's uh free agency. Like we do a lot for that. Um, the prospecting, like we put the dynasty show on hiatus during the NFL regular season and then bring it back right away as soon as the regular season is over. So um, we're doing dynasty shows and quickly getting up to speed on some of the prospects. Uh, so, yeah, it's pretty much free agency and rookie stuff, um, making sure the rankings are in order. You know, we do rankings pretty much around the calendar. It's 365 days like. I want to have my first set of the next season's rankings out before the Super Bowl. And, and you know, that's just kind of how it is. And I know people get hungry for it. As soon as championship belts are awarded, people want to start thinking ahead and, uh, you know, figuring out how they're going to get their hands on one if they didn't win a title. So, uh, you know, we go we go 365 days a year, Coop. Yeah, and with Dynasty, best ball, I mean, I'm the same way, man. I'm the same way. So no, no cool down here. Uh, if you could give one, one part of your game that you feel gives you an advantage and it can be anything, you know, we've had uh, some guests talk about 
little moves they make when they're making trades, uh, types of players they avoid in the draft, types of players they gravitate towards, statistics that they use. Is there anything you feel gives you an advantage? Is there something out there you can kind of throw to the fancy alarm crew who might not see all your content all the time? Oh, man. Well, um, this is probably not unique to me vis-a-vis the fantasy alarm crew because you guys have this too. But just being in this industry, it's like, got all these extra resources. You have a question about anyone, you know, someone's like, if I have a tight end question, I'm coming to Andrew Cooper. You know, like if, if someone hits me up with a trade where they're offering me, uh, I don't know, uh, David Njoku, and I'm, I'm looking for the long-term outlook on Njoku, uh, I can come and ask you. So it's nice to be able to, um, have a bunch of people who you can sort of, uh, you know, poke behind the scenes and, and get their advice. Also, um, I, like other than that, I don't know if there's really anything just generally when I play fantasy, I'm always more pass catcher focused than running back focused. And it's not, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm always like zero RB or anything, but I, I just feel like wide receiver is more of a, what you see is what you get position. And it's easier to measure statistically, um, see benchmarks for success and, and figure out things a little bit better um you know i feel like wide receiver is science evaluating that position and and running back is alchemy like it's just um honest to god like when people give me yards after contact per carry stats like i kind of don't care because like those they vary so wildly year to year like i don't think they're predictive i I was just watching i was just watching clips of devon hn the other day and i thought to myself the same thing like there was one play where he barely gets touched and then he runs for 60 yards and i'm like you just had 60 yards after contact but that's not what that's supposed to measure right so like i'm with you on that and i will say is the contact a guy getting squared up or is it a guy getting two fingers on him as he's going by i want to see yeah what about a stat of like continuous contact like who can get that yard when you need the yard? That's a, that's a football stat, you know, kind of getting glanced and, you know, and then compiling that and averaging it. I mean, it's just, it's not, it's more a measure of breakaway speed sometimes than anything else. So I'm with you. And I will say the, I'm, I'm so with you on wide receivers. One, there was one year that just burned everybody so bad with that, that set, it set that mentality back with 2017. Remember it was like uh, the running backs that year were, you know, um, were, Christian McCaffrey, Alvin Kamara, uh, you couldn't miss Dalvin Cook, Joe Mixon, and um, and Leonard Fournette, and the top wide receivers were like Corey Davis and and uh, and John Ross. And that year, I feel like it just huge setback for the wide receiver first people. But in most other years, that is the case. It's much easier to predict. To predict. They last longer. So I'm with you on that. Uh, and to your very first point, I just want to point out to people. If you want not just the opinion of me, but the opinion of all of our experts, you can go over to fantasyalarm.com slash win, become a member now, our annual membership, 40% off. And you can directly ask me about tight ends, about football. You can ask Howard Bender about baseball, Jim Bowden. You can go in there, our MMA guys, our PGA guys, um, Matthew Sells, NASCAR writer of the year. You can go in, you know, three-time NASCAR writer of the year. You can go in and ask them that. So go get set up over there. Uh, and you'll be good to go. Uh, so, all right, let's get in. Let's get into our last segment. Last question I want to ask you, Fitz, before we go in, is that like, because wh- a lot of people play different formats, and that's the format that's kind of in your mind. So, for you, what's the format that kind of lives in your head? Like, when when I ask you a question, what's the what's your kind of default format? Oh man, um, so. Well, I, like I'm more of a redraft guy than dynasty, but are we talking sure. dynasty specifically since it's um, like my dynasty yeah. f- format preferred is 12 teams, super flex, um, 30 man rosters is good. And I, I would prefer to play without IR. Um, I just okay. like I like a little more action on waivers in season. I, I know like with 30 man rosters and 12 teams, it's still mostly going to be tumbleweeds out there. But if you can like if every team can put four guys, five guys on IR, then there's really nothing out there. I, like I like the dilemma of, you know, if you've got a guy hurt long term, are you going to ride it out with him or are you going to uh, just like cut bait and, and get immediate help? Right. Um, obviously if it's a star, you're going to keep him for the long haul, but if it's kind of a marginal guy, what do you do? It's, it's, I don't know, kind of interesting. So I, like, I, I don't think a 
bunch of IR spots are necessary. One or two tops, if you insist on having IR. But um, so, yeah, like, and always super flex, man. Like I, nothing I against the one QB people, but, um, you know, it's just after your startup draft, all you're doing subsequently is rookie drafts. And rookie drafts are so much more interesting when quarterbacks are more valuable. Way more, way more interesting. And again, redraft one QB. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's, it's If you're doing a startup now, then do it as a super flex draft. That's, that's where we're living, man. And uh, I will say with the IR, the IRs, especially when there's a lot of them, gives me anxiety because this time of year, I always throw so many guys on my IR and then I forget about it. And then this time of year comes around and I need to cut my roster down. And it's like, I, I, in, in my mind, I'm like, oh yeah, I got to cut three guys. I have three picks, but I have five guys in my IR. So now I'm like, oh, I got to, I have to cut eight guys right now. It's like, I, I didn't, I'm with you on that. It's way more simple. If it's just, this is your team, your bench is deep enough in 30 man bench, your bench is deep enough. You don't need the extra spots. So I'm with you on that. Uh, all right, folks, let's get to the, uh, the meat and potatoes of the show. An idea that I had and actually had the idea that I thought of you. So I was like, Let's get Pat Fitz on because I know he's plugged into uh, who these players are. I've listened to you again. I listen to a lot of your shows, so I know you've got takes on on the vast majority of these guys. But what I've been doing is I've been doing uh, all the all the free agency stuff at Fantasy Alarm. So I've been going through and saying who's going where, who's going here, what are the spots that need to be filled, and what type of players uh, fill those spots. And I've kind of been tracking all that, and I have a bunch of spots, a bunch of player types where I said, oh, wouldn't it be great if this team got T. Higgins? Well, they didn't, right? So now I have this spot where I'm thinking, okay, uh, why don't I ask Pat Fitz who fits that mold, right? So uh, I think this is a, a, a beautiful thing here. Uh, I, the first one I want to ask is uh, just to, without needling it down and getting too specific on player types with the first question, we already talked about the QBs you like. At the very top, let's say it does start – uh, let's say it starts three quarterbacks and the Cardinals are going to pick a wide receiver. Uh, you have Marvin Harrison Jr. as your top wide receiver. I do. Yeah, okay. I do. And it like, it's not to, uh, you know, crap on Malik neighbors in right. any way. Like it, it's great. It's like choosing between mint, mint chocolate chip, ice cream and cookie dough. You know, I love both uh, mint, right. mint chips, my jam, but uh, you know, I'm not going to turn down cookie dough, ice cream, like two phenomenal players. Great playmakers. I both guys are absolutely in the can't miss category. Yeah, and, and, and like Odunze, a, you know, not not a distant third either, like a clear third. Yes. But in most other drafts, Odunze would probably be number one. Well, that actually answered my kind of next question: is who, how do you have those guys ranked? Uh, so good. Uh, all right, next one is the and this is in a normal class, it's usually easier to find, but in this class. The running backs are kind of all over the place. So if we look at a team like the Cowboys or even the Chargers to some degree, but specifically the Cowboys right now, who is, in your opinion, the best full every down feature back that they could take? Like the, if you were going to pick a, and it might not even be the guy you think goes first off the board because some guys, you know, they, 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 they catch passes or whatever. But if you were going to pick a guy that could be a full three down back for a team like the Cowboys, who would you, who would you pick? Boy, so this is really interesting, Coop, in that there is not an obvious candidate, as you were just right. mentioning. And that the guys who sort of have the body types that you look for and maybe um, maybe the potential to do it. Guys like uh, Trey Benson, tested like a champ, has an absolute, you know, um, just prototypical NFL running backs body. Um, I maybe Marshawn Lloyd could fit into that category too. But then you go back and look at their numbers from college and these guys did not have workhorse roles for their respective teams. These guys barely average double digit carries a game in college. The guys who actually have done the heavy duty stuff in college are these mighty mouse types. Um, Ray Davis from Kentucky, uh, Blake Corum, who, who I, you know, in my book is the best peer runner in this class. And I know he's like a little overaged, a little undersized. Um, like he's kind of my favorite. Kamani Vidal from Troy is a guy I think a lot of people are going to sleep on. And this guy, he's now the all-time leading rusher for Troy and a, a good pass catcher too. And I think one of the knocks on him, like definitely good at the between the tackle stuff and, and running through traffic and everything. I don't think 
anyone was expecting him to run a 4-5-40 at the combine. Goes out and runs a 4-4-7. Thor Nystrom and I were talking about him maybe being at like 4-6 at the combine. Right. When he ran a 4-4-7, like the hair on my arms stood up, Coop. Like, because I, mean, I, Thor had been like pumping this guy up and, and talking to me about him. And then all of a sudden when I saw that time. Um, so I'll say Kamani Vidal for a guy who's probably going to be a third or fourth round rookie pick in most dynasty drafts. And awesome. uh, yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's a guy I'm pretty excited about. I love that. I could see, you know, the chargers and Blake Corum, like everybody wants Harbaugh yeah, to get his guy, but like, yeah. And I know you mentioned Marshawn Lloyd. That's the Derek Brown special right there. He came. Oh around. yeah. He's, he's, yeah, in. he's, he's, in. he's, uh, you know, like, and I had Lloyd sort of maybe towards the back of my top 10 for running back prospects. And, Debro actually sold me on it. He's got him yeah. RB one in the class. Which, I've, yeah, I've, yeah, that's great. I've got him up to RB four. I moved so him up uh, too. I moved him up too. Yeah, he's. I mean, he's really interesting for sure. Um, seems like a, a super good kid, tough competitor. So it'll be interesting. But again, he did not have a big role at USC, so it takes a little bit of projection on him. Yeah, for sure. But hey, you know what? That's why you got to do the work. You know, and and I respect the process. That's I moved him up too after talking to D bro. So we'll see if he's right there. Uh next one here, and this my neck of the woods, uh, but I want to get your thoughts on it. Tight end. All right. I look around and just like we talked about with that last one, a guy that can do it all with at running back at tight end, there's some guys that are just pure blockers, you know, got like guys like Mercedes Lewis. Then there's guys that are just kind of like pass catchers like Mike Gusecki. Who who do you think is the best? two-way tight end there's a few teams like the dolphins for instance that could use a two-way tight end i know they have johnny smith but you still want to keep loading up the the rams because they use so many three wide receiver sets they need just kind of one guy they don't they don't really they can't really afford to rotate multiple guys so uh and for this one i'm not gonna let you pick brock bowers because he's kind of the answer to everything i know that, that's he's he's the easy answer for every tight end question but who's a good who, who's a good two-way tight end that you'd like to see the uh, the Dolphins take and maybe say, okay, you know what, Johnny's going to start now, but you can maybe be able to develop into our George Kittle role or our Dalton Schultz role in this offense. Yeah, that's an interesting one, Coop, because I don't know that there is a, uh, you know, Gronk or even poor man's Gronk in this class as far as the block, like not the greatest class to get a blocking. By, by poor man's end. Gronk, you mean Michael Mayer, right? <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean like i i think maybe the only exceptional blocking tight end and uh and now i'm blanking on, on his name it's the kid from illinois to only I'd like tip raymond tip yes. Ryman? yeah tip yeah, Ryman. yeah, yeah. He's, a, he's a crusher at blocking for sure I, right and he's like the drew sample of this class but i think he had like 19 catches for illinois last oh. year he's not going to help you much in the fantasy realm um maybe ben sanat uh yeah. from from kansas states um who tested like a champ at the combine relative athletic score like 972 or something like that um 49 catches almost 700 yards for k-state last year and uh can hold up as an inline blocker maybe not like plus plus in that area but capable so he's the guy that comes to mind and um uh, i ran this one by d bro just because i wasn't like i wanted to sort of check myself on this since like you know, beyond the top two, a tight end, it gets pretty sketchy. And uh, Sanat's the first name he threw at me too. So I guess I, I was on maybe on the right track here. Yep, absolutely. I was, you know, I've got my own opinions on it too. Those are the guys that I would go for. Another day, the only other name I would throw out is maybe like a Theo Johnson, just because he tested so well. And like yep. you look at George Kittle, he was a fifth round pick that just tested really well. So, you know, that's kind of what they're, they're looking for their version of that because that's the offense they run. But yeah, I'm with you. Ben Sanat is is probably the guy that I, I'm going to peg to go to like the Dolphins. That'd be a nice one. Uh, and, okay, so we've done a wide receiver, running back, tight end. Let's hit on quarterback. You've already talked about the first few guys. Uh, let's look, look look at the teams like the Raiders, the Giants, the Saints, where they have a quarterback, but in the back of their mind, they might still be thinking, you know, maybe we want to take a stab on another guy, see if we can catch lightning in a bottle in like a th second or third round. You know, Jalen Hurts, second round pick, uh, right uh third round picks, Russ Wilson, fourth round pick. There's a few out there. It's hard to find them. But if when you get out away from the top four QBs, who's the guy that you would like for me, say maybe the Saints or the Raiders to pick where they look at what they have and say, hey, let's let's throw one more guy in the room and see what happens. 
Yeah, I'm not sure if this guy's still going to be a first rounder or not. But I, like, I like Michael Penix. I've been a, a fan since he was playing at Indiana. You know, I'm I'm up here in Big Ten country. Went to a Big Ten school, so uh, like, I follow the Big Ten teams closely. Fell in love with him at Indiana. Um, I know he's been through a lot. Been through two ACL surgeries, but his arm talent, Coop, is just um, like this is a dude who can win from the pocket in the NFL. Like, there's no question about it. And I know. Maybe his um, prospect luster was diminished a bit by the national championship game. He just didn't play all that well against Michigan, but um, it's a really good defense. And uh, right. yeah, like, so Penix is one for sure. I mean, Spence, Spencer Rattler is a guy who had a really good off season, like senior ball combine really impressed people. I think the arm talent is NFL caliber for sure. Um, it's just that, you know, like, kind of a checkered college career. Like he was not um, what Oklahoma was hoping he would be. And uh, things were a little better at South Carolina, but uh, you know, not totally great there either sometimes. And uh, I don't know, he's, he's become more interesting. And I think maybe for those teams that feel like they could um, they might have a stop gap in place for 2020 through 2023 Rattler might be an interesting developmental guy. Yeah, my dad wants Spencer Rattler, and I'm uh, we're Patriots fans. I'm just like, dude, we pick at three. I'm like, let's focus on. I'm like, let's focus on three first, and then I'm like, the moment that they pick someone else at three, then you and me could talk about Spencer Rattler and all yes. that. I'm like, I'm like, let's not, let's just let's stay in our lane for now. But uh, he he likes him. He's in. So and with Michael Penix, like I, the one thing I, because obviously the injuries, you got to question that. But teams are going to do their homework on the medicals. The one thing I hate is people saying, oh, well, he was throwing all these great wide receivers. It's like I watched Joe Burrow throw to Justin Jefferson and Jamar Chase and Terrace Marshall. And I watched, uh, you know, I, we just watched uh, a Dunes, you know, uh, sorry, Malik Neighbors on LSU as well. It's like LSU has good wide receivers. We're not knocking those quarterbacks. So I, I, that's a criticism I don't like. I don't like that one. Uh, to, and who's to say that these guys weren't great because of the of the quarterback? You know what I mean? So uh something to be said there something to be said yeah i mean and uh to your point on Penix, like um you know jalen mcmillan got hurt in 2023 and jalen polk wasn't really on the map uh and and Penix helped put him on the map and all of a sudden polk has shown up in people's top 10 lists in a great year at wide receiver so um yeah like i totally agree with you on that don't don't count it against Penix just because he has good pass catching talent around him right bingo uh, so, okay, let's go back to wide receiver. And this was the, this question was the one that kind of spawned the whole idea. Cause I've been thinking about a couple teams that could use a big split end, right? And for those that, that don't know what I'm talking about, split end specifically means you, you tether your foot to the line and you fight the jam. You have to have seven guys on the line. So, you know, smaller guys can run around the slot and flanker. But a lot of times you need a bigger guy to, if you want to have that role in your offense. Guys like Mike Evans, Michael Pittman, Nico Collins, Cortland Sutton go back through time. It's been a big role within this league. So I look at teams like the Lions, for instance. They have the flank, the slot flanker, Amaro St. Brown. They have a tight end, Sam Laporta. They have a field stretcher in Jamison Williams. They have a good line. They have tremendous running backs. But that's the one thing they're kind of missing. And they, they let Josh Reynolds go. So when I look at this class and say, wow, the you know, the the Lions need to load up on defense, but if they were to take one position on offense, is there a kind of a bigger body split end wide receiver that or give me a couple if you want that you think would would slide right in and make that an incredibly complete offense? I'll give you two, Coop, cuz one I think is going to be inside the top 40 okay. in the draft and the other is going to be somewhere outside the top 40, somewhere on day 2. Um Keon Coleman is my guy. And like, uh, I think I'm probably higher on him. It'd be, than a perfect. Lot of It'd be perfect fit though. It'd be perfect. Yeah. Like Derek Brown and I have gone to, uh, we have clashed on Keon Coleman a lot. And uh, like, I just having watched him, I know his college numbers were not dazzling, but he is, I think in the Des Bryant's, Mike Evans, George Pickens category, like not a great separator, but the ball skills are just incredible. I mean, he is, he, he played basketball for Tom Izzo at Michigan state before he got to Florida state and he played right away as an underclassman. So like uh, you see it in Keon Coleman's game. He is a rebounder. He has got that 
throw it outside the frame of this dude's body. And he's probably coming down with it unless you throw it 10 feet over his head or, or bounce it to him. Like he, his reach is phenomenal. I think he's kind of underrated as a route runner, to be honest. Um, and he, he's just kind of a bully with smaller cornerbacks. So um, I, I like him a lot. And I know some people might get turned off by the fact that he ran like a four, six at the combine. But then he did that gauntlet drill and he had the highest top speed of anyone running that and looked smooth as hell uh, catching the, those balls. Yeah, he got up to 20. Puk, that's the Puka Nakua, isn't it? Yep. That's exactly what happened with Puka Nakua, where he, he was slower in the 40, but he was the fastest guy through the gauntlet. Yeah, I think uh, Coleman hit like 20.7 miles an hour running that thing and just looked phenomenal. So um, he's my guy earlier in the draft and a little later, uh, Xavier uh, Leggett from oh, yeah, yeah, South yeah. Carolina. Another big dude, 6'1", like 220, 221, something like that. Um, and he's kind of an interesting case because he was a late bloomer and sort sort of a one-year wonder, and that was like his fifth year. So I know a lot of the people who are in early breakout age are going to be off Xavier Leggett. But I think, oh man, and I wish I could remember his story. There was kind of a reason for the slower pace of development with him. So um, I, I don't hold it against him as much as I, you know, I don't necessarily think he's the Kenny Pickett of wide receivers, um, but a big dude and like was really compelling. I know he had a bad first day at the senior ball, then came back on the second day and had a fantastic day. Um, so yeah, like he's, he's a really intriguing guy. I don't know if he's can't miss, but um, he is that, that big X type uh, who would fit the bill of, of what you described. Coop. Yeah. And I'll tell you for, with a lot of these guys, the breakout age, got to remember that a lot of these programs when COVID happened, just shut it down. So there's yep. a lot of guys that missed, missed the year of development and also, you know, just didn't straight up play for a year. So I'm not going to really hammer, hammer it over the head with, with some of these guys and people love Roma Dunze, right? You and I both like him, but you got to remember this guy went back to school and then had, you know, coming into that, the most contested catches he had in the year was four. He comes out and that's 21 as a, in his fourth year. I mean, like, if you're going to knock guys for that, then you got to start at the top. And we don't like doing that, right? We like to exclude the guys we like and use it against the guys we don't like. So for me, uh, you know, I take it all with grain of salt. And, uh, you know, I just last thing on that topic, the Lions, not a great spot for fantasy football because of all the other targets there, but it would complete their offense. There are other teams where it would be great spots for fantasy football. Talk about the New England, like the New England Patriots, right? They draft a quarterback at three and then circle back for a legat. They have – all the other slot flankers with the Kendrick Bournes and the DeMarro Douglases, this guy can play right away on the outside opposite Hunter Henry in an offense with a, a young QB. So uh, keep an eye on that, that type of pairing, you know, Devontae Parker's gone. It's wide open out there. So uh, there's a lot of spots out there for, for guys like that. Uh, let me get into, let's do another running back. Uh, you gave us some, a, th a three down back. Some of these teams have a good pass catching back, but might want to add a bruiser back. And the fantasy dynasty gamers of the world might want to cover their ears on this one because I know we always root for the incumbent guys. We just we like, oh, they didn't they didn't sign anybody. Like it's wheels up. But some of these teams like the Buffalo Bills, right? They have James Cook, who's a great pass catching back. You know, Damian Harris didn't really pan out. He's retiring. They tried. We know they've been trying to find this guy because they brought in Damian Harris and they brought in uh they brought in Leonard Fournette and they brought in uh, Latavius Murray. Like they've been trying to find a bruiser, a team like that, or maybe the Bucks with Rashad White. Who's a who's a big like two down bruiser back? They could doesn't need to catch passes. So so take that out. Who's a really good just pure rusher that that could work for a team like that? Well, thanks for letting me have the opportunity to be a homer and say Braylon Allen from the University of Wisconsin. Um, yeah. You know, 235, 240 pounds, just a, a monster and an unbelievable physical specimen. Chose not to run at the combine or at his pro day, but I don't think he's that slow. It, it was kind of interesting to me because I really thought he could have done something in the four fives, but um, I know maybe he had doubts about that since he chose not to run. It doesn't really matter. Um, it just like so hard to bring down. The guy is just a, a beast. Um, he, he does not have quite the vision or the footwork that Jonathan Taylor did, but Taylor was, you know, just an extraordinary prospect. Um, but he's still pretty good. 
Like he, he's not great changing direction. He has to gather himself a little, but uh, this is definitely a dude who can make his own holes. And uh, for the people who do like the young breakout age stuff, I mean, Braylon Allen is one of the youngest dudes in this entire draft class at any position. And yet he has more hundred yard rushing games than anyone else in this running back class. Right. Like he was productive from the jump at Wisconsin. And, uh, you know, like he's not going to catch passes. He did it a little bit at Wisconsin. His hands are fine, but it's just like it takes a little bit. Uh, he's just not really good at gathering the ball and then quickly getting upfield. It's just not his thing. I mean, it's kind of like um, Alex Dunlap of Roster Watch telling me that, you know, he's, he'd watched Derrick Henry in high school. He's like, I swear he can catch passes. But, you know, why are you bothering with that when you got a guy who's built like that? And uh, Braylon Allen is definitely a Derrick Henry body type. So he would be first and foremost is just pure early down thumper. He he has to be at the top of the list. Right. And you got to remember, it's another level too. like Anthony Sherman was I guy I grew up playing with. He had the best hands in the state of Massachusetts. But at the NFL, he's a fullback. Right. Because right. it's just like right. it's a, just another level of game. But yeah, I mean, like I, when I watch him, he kind of reminds me of of Brandon Jacobs a little bit, uh, just kind of big, like running people over, runs a little upright, kind of like Jacobs did. But like J people forget Jacobs, you know, his career ended early, but he was good for a span there. And yeah. and that's that's all they need is somebody that can that can take the short yardage workload off of the guys that are there. Because I don't think you you won't want Josh Allen run, taking himself. You don't want to run it up the gut with with James Cook. I think they that would be huge for that team to have a guy like that that can. Yeah, Brand, Brandon Jacobs is a great comp. That is a great comp for Braylon Allen. You want to want a comp that you're not going to like? Uh -oh. <laughs> Ron Dane. Ron Dane. Yeah, I, I knew that. Was I just I don't even comp him to Ron Dane. I just because you're a Wisconsin guy, I have to throw a little Ron Dane on there, dude. <laughs> <laughs> totally understandable, but big, hey, a lot ball. of lot of lot of good memories between those two guys for me, though. So uh, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll take that comp. Yeah, yeah, why not? Uh, all right, let's move on to uh, let's move on to uh, back to tight end. Uh, and I did mention, you know, we talked about two way tight end. Looking at like the Jets and the Chargers, where they're kind of loaded, they have plenty of inline tight ends like Tyler Conklin and and Will Disley and Donald Parham. They could use like a slot tight end. I thought that maybe Mike Gusecki could end up going to a team like the Jets, but then he signed with the Bengals, right? And they like they like Tanner Hudson, so Gusecki can kind of be their Tanner Hudson type guy. But I look at a team like the Jets or the Chargers. Who's a tight end that could be like a pure pass catching slot type tight end? Like obviously there's no Evan Ingram in this class because nobody ran a four four two. But is there anybody that that kind of profiles as that kind of slot tight end guy to you? Yeah. Um, so I also ran this one by Debro and we kind of came up with the same guy as, as the first guy off the top of our heads. And like, I don't think either of us are wildly confident that this guy is going to be a, a can't miss type, but Jaheim let me guess Jaheim Bell. I was going to, yeah, guess Jaheim yeah. Bell. A Florida. Guess. And, and that's the thing, Coop, like he is, he's an interesting case. Cause he's only yeah. like six, two, right. Maybe goes about two forty. So, uh, definitely not a guy you want doing inline blocking for you, but, um, it, has a lot of experience lining up in the slot and, and sort of being that pass catcher guy wasn't like wildly prolific at Florida state, but um, generally good things happen when they got the ball in his hands. And I, I know they'd occasionally line him up in the backfield um, versatile weapon, good, good catch and run guy. Um, but yeah, definitely not a blocking tight end. Right. I'll give you my comp for him. Um, I spent a lot of time looking through it and it's a uh, Chigakonkwa. Uh, Chig Conquo, similarly sized. Chig's actually a little bit faster, but I don't think it's a meaningful difference in speed. Uh, the you know for, for Dynasty, I'm with you though. I think the the question is this: with the, those guys, those kind of mid sized guys, is if you're not going to be an inline guy, you need to be good enough to be better at slot than the wide receivers. And there's only so many of those guys. There's Evan Engram, Mark Andrews. The rest of them end up being Cameron Bray or Anthony Ferkser, where you're good enough to be the big dog that rotates but they'll rotate you out for a slot guy right so i do worry about that with gene bell i'm with you on that but in the right spot where he gets a full-time role it's entirely possible so uh yeah but yeah i'm with you gene bells that's the answer to that question 100 yeah you gotta definitely have the right play caller for sure but in most yeah. cases these guys are not going to be playing 70 percent or more of the snaps which is 
kind of the ceiling for their fantasy production. Chan Gailey, where are you? You've Chan Gailey was the <laughs> yes. one dude that right, yeah. like he's the one dude that would be like, uh, you know, he'd use like Eric Decker, Gasecki, uh, you know, uh, I think David Nelson with the Bills for a bit. He's oh, just like right, big wow. slot. Yeah, yeah. I, I haven't thought of that name for a while. I know that's a deep that's a deep cut. But with with the uh, when he coached the Chiefs, Tony Gonzalez had played the second most slot snaps behind only Heinz Ward. Not to, by only Heinz Ward. It's like Chan Gailey as a tight end guy. I'm sitting here. I'm like, let's bring that offense back. That is a great offense for tight ends. But uh, yeah, so they, Gene Bell needs something like that. Uh, all right, let's hit it with a couple last ones. I'll get you out of here. Uh, let's let's go back to quarterback. All right, and we talked about you like Michael Penix. Uh, deep, maybe deeper in the draft or in the same group. There's teams like the Ravens, Colts, Cardinals. They they have mobile quarterbacks, obviously, you know, and in the case of Lamar Jackson, they just lost Tyler Huntley. They had kind of that type of player where if the starter gets hurt, you just bring in Huntley. He can run the same offense, has similar skill sets. Is there a is there kind of a deeper quarterback? Uh, and same thing with the Colts with Andy Richardson, the Cardinals with Kyler Murray. Is there kind of a deeper quarterback that's mobile? And you could say, okay, if this guy gets hurt, we're going to have this guy come in. He can run this exact same offense. Honestly, probably not. In this class, Coop, I feel like there isn't. I mean, Michael Pratt maybe is a guy who was a, a four-year starter, um, decent arm, good mobility. Like there aren't there aren't too many guys who I think are going to be day three quarterbacks who I'm at all interested in in this class. Joe Milton, just because of the pure arm talent, but he does not exactly. Yeah, I mean, like he might have the strongest arm of any quarterback on the planet right now, yeah, including no, anyone no in the joke. NFL. Like his arm is just he puts balls into orbit. I tell and, you, if he if it doesn't pan out, then he should go do javelin because I bet that <laughs> dude can chalk a stick. Man, I used to do javelin myself, and I'm watching this guy. I'm like, I bet this guy could if he if he if he spent time doing it with an arm like that. I mean, you never know. Yeah, the only thing is, as as Thor Nystrom has said, like he is nuclear Lelouch from Bull Durham. He is a rocket, but you don't yeah. know where it's going half the time. So oh, uh, yeah, yeah. fun fun guy if you can get the mechanics down and and work on the accuracy a little bit, but. Uh, as far as like mobility, I mean, you've seen how big that dude is. He's he's probably not the guy you want back. No, 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 uh, no. Lamar Jackson or Kyler Murray are running those offenses if those guys go down. I do want, I would love the Patriots at one point. This is when I was a lot younger, but they used to have a guy that was their backup. His name was, do you remember Michael Bishop? Oh, yeah. And yeah, from he, from K State, right? Okay, so you yeah. even to call it, so that's you too. You're a sharp one, Fitz. <laughs> but my, Michael Bishop had a cannon arm, so he never played. But they would bring him in every once in a while just to throw a hail mary. And when he came out, like even though we knew it wasn't going to convert, it was just fun to watch that guy come out and be like, "All right, here comes the cannon." So I hope Joe Millen does land somewhere, and that's kind of the deal, right? You look at some of these quarterbacks that maybe don't have big arms, just to be like, "All right." You know what? Let's bring them in and just see like a 70 yes. yard chuck. That'd be beautiful. Uh, okay. Uh, there's a, so this is kind of a pick your favorite guy. Cause I think this class has a million of these guys, but teams like the Bengals lost Tyler Boyd. Uh, the jets now have two really good outside wide receivers, but don't really have that smaller guy. The Steelers trade away Deontay Johnson. Who is a good slot flanker that pr- let's, let's leave out the guys that you think are going to go in the first but who's your favorite kind of just it doesn't need to be big, just needs to be good in space, a good slot flanker for a team like that. Yeah, I'll mention a guy who's pretty underrated. And uh, we were sort of talking about his school earlier, Jalen McMillan of Washington. Okay. Yeah. And a lot of people have him as the third best Washington wide receiver in this class. I, I kind of like him a little more than Jalen Polk. Polk yeah. And people forget that in 2022, Jalen McMillan led the Washington Huskies in receptions. He had two more than Roma Dunze that year. Mm -hmm. Um, He had, I I think, let's see, uh, 79 catches for McMillan in 2022. Uh, Odunze had 1,145 yards. McMillan, 1,098 yards. So, like, they were, that was a one-two punch for Washington. Oh, and McMillan had more touchdowns that year, 9-7 to over Odunze. Then McMillan hurts his knee in 2023, tried to play through it a little bit, what, clearly wasn't himself. I think they shut him down for a little while. And then Jalen Polk kind of comes onto the scene and makes a name for himself. But like McMillan is this, I I think he's going to be a zone beater in the NFL, has a a nice knack for sort of finding open space. 
Um, like he's not, not really a physical guy, not a contested catch guy, not a tackle breaker, but, um, you know, we know well, how I much. Sh- zone- I, I asked for you to replace Tyler Boyd. So I think, you know, like that's, you're describing the kind of guy, right? I mean, like yeah. he, doesn't, he doesn't need to, he doesn't need to make contested catches because they have T Higgins. He doesn't need to break tackles. He just needs to be able to operate in space. Right. So, yeah. And I, I think that's kind of what you have with him. There's a lot of uh, like NFL teams play a lot of zone defense now. And uh, mm-hmm. I think Mac- McMillan is going to be an NFL zone beater. Perfect. That's exactly what I was looking for. So on my radar now, and not to mention we've seen times where, you know, the first wide receiver drafted from a team, isn't the best one. Paris Campbell was drafted before Terry McLaurin in the same draft. And, uh, Look how that panned out. So, you know, not crazy that the, you know, a guy that even if he goes third on that team, there's who knows what happens after that. So uh could be there. Let me hit you with two quick ones to wrap us up. One, we talked about the every down back. We talked about the plotter back. I look at teams like specifically the Chiefs, right, where they have Isaiah Pacheco. He runs hard. He, he runs angry. But the Jerick McKinnon rule is kind of open where they could use like a satellite back. Is there any like third down satellite back type type player that you think could go to a team like the chiefs or like the Browns, right? The Browns have Donta Foreman now and Nick Chubb, maybe they could use a little Foreman doesn't catch balls. So then maybe they could use a little somebody there to help out. Is there any satellite back that, that you think could potentially rack up some targets? Yeah. If you can overlook the disappointing 40 time Bucky Irving from Oregon, who caught 56 balls for the ducks last year, and um, he is slippery, like he's elusive after the catch. He's just like not a burner. As as we saw, I don't think there was a, a more disappointing moment from the combine than when Bucky Irving at 192 pounds ran a four, five, six. Like that mm. really let the air out of a lot of balloons. I mean, I know some people who had Bucky Irving as like a top three running back before that happened. Right. So, um, but you know, let's not write off a guy for a, a slow 40 time as I personally did with Kyron Williams. I was just going to say ago. Kyron so, was undersized, slow, and then turns out guy can just ball. He can just play ball, you know? Yeah. Di- different kind of player. And I, someone just pointed out in the chat, like Bucky can't block. I, I know, but like, you're not, you're not bringing in Bucky to block. You're bringing him in uh, to catch passes. Yeah. That can, that can be the killer. But I mean, the thing is you never know with the, Depending on the scheme, you might be able to figure it out. You'd be surprised uh, with some of these backs. Like the s- smartness is part of it. Marshawn, uh, Marshawn Lynch was a great blocker because he was smart. Gio Bernard is never a big guy, but he was a great blocker because he understood the scheme and he knew how to set himself up to, you know, count the count the defenders and set himself up to make the block at the right angle. Right. So you never know. You can figure it out. But yeah, I saw the same thing that tape tape not uh not impressive and, and the ratings were good all right last one and then we'll get you out of here uh give me a again teams like the ravens raiders they've got a big big wide out they have their slot guys maybe need a speedy field stretcher and with the word field stretcher is kind of a uh, a dirty word in fantasy football these days but sometimes guys are brought in to be the field stretcher and they develop a full route tree tyreek hill brandon cooks Santana Moss, and then they're great for fantasy. So uh, who are some of the guys that fit the bill that, that can immediately stretch the field for these teams? Yeah. I mean, Xavier worthy is fast, but obviously um, like with his crazy 40 time, but he did have a lower average depth of target than Adnai Mitchell at Texas last year. So um, let Troy Franklin from Oregon, like big play guy for sure. Um, he, he can do it. And uh, like, I think, he's going to be a top 50 pick, but maybe later in the draft. And this guy is a little developmental. He needs work, but the the raw material is there as far as size and speed. Tez Walker from North Carolina. I mean, he uh, is a burner and uh, he's pretty big to, he's just kind of a go route guy at this point. Need to develop him a little bit because route running is not his thing at all right now. No, but, I've, uh, I've seen him on, uh, but he can chase the ball down and, and, oh, yeah. and get underneath oh, yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, he can. He is a field stretcher, and that's kind of all he is right now. But maybe you can turn him into more. Nice. All right. Well, that's awesome, man. I appreciate that, folks out there. If you want to take advantage of this, uh, go over to myffpc.com. Use promo code Coop. They'll give you twenty five bucks when you deposit thirty five or more. There's two ways to take advantage of it now. You can do the dynasty draft, do the startup, do the super flex draft, like Pat Fitz says he likes playing. Or you can go and do early best ball drafts because we just talked about a bunch of landing spots. And if you sat there and you were like, oh, wow, what if 
uh, Xavier Leggett on the Patriots where he could be the split end and they just drafted Jaden Daniels or Drake May. And, and now he's going to be the top X receiver for that team. I want to take advantage of that now in best ball before we get to Dynasty Drafts. Well, you can go do that right now. Uh, hit that QR code on the screen. The link is in the description or use promo code COOP, C-O-O-P. They'll give you 25 bucks when you deposit $35 or more. And that's where I like to play FFPC for, for Dynasty and best ball. So go get that set up. Uh, but that's it for ads. That's it for us. Thank you so much, man. Can you just tell everybody uh, the Dynasty podcast? Like, I'm so glad it's back. I really do love checking out those episodes. But tell us what else you got going on at Fantasy Pros right now. Oh, thanks for that, Coop. And thanks for having me. Always great chopping it up with you. Um, pretty much we are in heavy pre draft season, doing a lot of prospect stuff. So check out the uh, Fantasy Pros Dynasty podcast. Um, it's two episodes a week right now, uh, mm -hmm. one with myself, Ryan Wormley and Scott Bogman and the other with Derek Brown and Thor Nystrom. So um, we're giving people a lot of dynasty goodness, have a lot of articles and stuff, a lot of best ball stuff. Um, you know, we're still doing redraft stuff right now, getting people ready for that. So check out fantasypros.com. Find me on Twitter at Fitz underscore FF. Yeah, man, Fitz, you're the best. And you folks in the Thanks. chat, you're the best for supporting us. Thank you so much. Hit that like, subscribe on YouTube. Give us a review on the podcast, but that's it. We're out of here. From Andrew Cooper and Fantasy Alarm, catch you guys next week.